Hello everyone, my name is Jeff and I'm a content producer and today I'm talking with Peter Melton who is the programming teacher and esports general manager at Miami Lakes Educational Center. And today we're going to talk about his esports club and how COVID-19 has pretty much changed everything when it comes to teaching. So to begin with, can you tell me about your role at Miami Lakes Educational Center? Sure, sure thing, Jeff. Well, first of all, good morning and thank you for interviewing me. I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. um, as you so eloquently said, I am the uh, programming teacher and I'm also the uh, the the esports general manager. I also am the sponsor for FBLA. And uh, we do also, I am, I'm also big into recruiting. I recruit a lot for the school. Okay, awesome. Uh, really quickly, FBLA? Uh, Future Business Leaders of America. Got it. Okay. And then uh, how did you get involved in video games and esports? Well, let's look at it from two paths. Mm -hmm. um, I, I bought, I'm 54 years old my daughter's 32 i bought her she was born in november and for that very first christmas i bought her a nintendo like the original I nintendo Ninten I, yeah i bought her a nintendo <laughs> she was two months old so, I, <laughs> so that's that <laughs> and um and so that was really because i fell in love with zelda i thought zelda was amazing mm -hmm. and prior to that i i have to tell you something I am so lucky to live in this time period because mm -hmm. I remember no computer. I remember Atari coming out and playing Pong <laughs> and and being mesmerized by Pong mm -hmm. and then all of the Pong spin-offs that came out in Atari. And then I remember going to high school and having access to my first computer, which was a pet Commodore. <laughs> and, and playing yes exactly a pet commodore that was at the high school had one pet commodore and playing lunar lander on that pet commodore now for those of you that don't know what lunar lander is it is a black and white game in which a little lunar lander rocket ship comes to the screen and you have to land it using the awsd screen to thrust <laughs> and left and right and wind adjustments and if you come in too hard you crash and die and, and you can hit things and I would spend hours that's where it started <laughs> so that's on the personal end as far as my enjoyment in video games and then quite frankly sometimes um it's better to be lucky than good hmm. they were starting this program in dade county and they involved 11 schools and they wanted to pilot this esports program and since i was the programming teacher and i also teach video game development and programming um i was logical choice and frankly, I could not have been happier. For me, this was, even though I was skeptical at first, and if you want, we can discuss a little bit of that, I was extremely skeptical because the one thing I would never do would be play games in class unless the mm -hmm. kids wrote the game and they were testing it. Okay. So um, I'm, I don't want to digress. So that's my <laughs> involvement through the personal side of it where I started playing back in 19... Oh gosh, 70 something <laughs> whenever the Atari came out. Yeah. And then when it when this great opportunity fell on my lap in September of uh, 2019. Well, uh, Lunar Lander sounds a lot <laughs> like a Kerbal Space Program that we have these days, just a lot less advanced. <laughs> I gotta see that. I have to look. Yeah, it's kind of the, it's kind of the up later. kind of the same uh, idea. Is like you have to build lander uh, rockets and modules oh, no. and launch them, and it's a, you have the whole space program. This yeah, is, it's much more advanced. And white, green, yeah, no, this is very very simple. Um, I think, though, your point of that you were skeptical skeptical is a good thing to talk about really quickly is, so can you talk sure. about some of your own skepticism? For... Sure. Um, as a teacher, it's very common for, hey, we got this great program. Mm -hmm. The district comes in all gung-ho, and all of a sudden they got you running with this great program, and all of a sudden you do it for a year, and it fizzles out. Okay. And in my 21 years of doing this, I've, I may have experienced that a dozen times. So in addition to that, um, now we're talking, this thing that we're adding is esports. Mm -hmm. Now I was well aware that esports was huge before that, but I had seen some specials. I had seen uh, Brian Gumbel did a very amazing uh, program on, on real sports where they talked about the popularity of esports, the crowd. So I was, I was aware of that. I was also aware of some articles that I had read on colleges picking this up. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but I wanted to see, before I incorporated this in my class at any significant level, the very, very first thing I did was I did some research 
and unfortunately, do you, off, off the top of your head, do you know the two major college divisions for esports? Off the top of my head, I do not. No, I, I don't want to Google it now, but I went and I found that one of those divisions had 450 schools as members mm -hmm. of that division. So my students took around 10 days, no, over, over, over a two week period, mm -hmm. and using a portion of the class period as an, and also for homework, we contacted all 450 <gasps> schools. All of them. <laughs> Dang. And we contacted all. Of them. And I'd say, unscientifically, 75% responded in some way or another. Mm -hmm. And these were schools that either had esports as an intramural program, had some type of academic program where they were working to prepare people to be esports, to work in the esports field, or they had a intercollegiate team okay. that was competing, you know, Brown versus Georgia Tech. You know what I'm saying? A la, a la Saturday morning football. Okay. And so what happened was I needed that for two reasons. No, three. Mm -hmm. I needed, number one, to convince myself that I was engaging my students in an activity that was real, that was academically rigorous and relevant to what they can do in the future. Number two, I had to convince my kid that this was not simply, okay, let's break out a switch and play. <laughs> and the biggest sell was the parents and administration that what we're doing is going to get your child to college somehow. Mm -hmm. You have so many kids. I could drive by the neighborhood in the, in the fall and in, here in Miami in the summertime, especially also all these kids playing baseball and football and stuff with the dream of going to college. Uh, I tell my parents that when I recruit, that I would not let my kid play football these days. I'm even scared of my kid playing soccer mm -hmm. at that point. Um, but I tell you something. Going to college on a League of Legends scholarship or an esports is a great way to go to college, and it's real. Mm -hmm. So we've also did some research as far as how much scholarship money was given out last year, and it peaked at it's 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 rising, but the it's at fifty million dollars in scholarships were awarded last year. That's a significant number. Yeah. And I didn't just I wasn't just saying this. I I had the articles and the things hung in my wall in my classroom, so when parents come in, they can see a New York Times article that said this, or a USA Today, you know, US um, News Report that said this. So it wasn't just, you know, me spewing out garbage. So that was a big deal for me, because it made it real for myself, which I need, you have to convince me first. Mm -hmm. And then it made it real my students. And then that was really outstanding, because I thought for sure, gaming would take over. Okay. And gaming hasn't taken over. Um, the biggest question that I've gotten from my students is, hey, Mr. Melton, is this a job? When I had four kids planning a tournament mm -hmm. and they were organizing a tournament and the tickets and the, and the, and the, the staging of it and okay. getting the, all, Everything. All the IT ready and stuff. Yeah, all the stuff that would be involved in a tournament. And he goes, Mr. Melton, is, is this a job? And he goes, yeah, this is a job. This is something that people do professionally and, and are paid very well to do. He goes, really, you're kidding me? I go, Mr. Melton, I'll tell you something. I wanted to be a programmer, but this is cool. <laughs> those are the questions. I got more of those questions than I did, hey, Mr. Melton, can I be a professional gamer? That's awesome. I didn't get any of, I didn't get any of those questions. I did get a lot more of the other ones. Awesome. That's very, very cool. And I love that you take it upon yourself to be convinced first and you do a lot of research. It seems, I mean, contacting 400 plus schools is... An enormous challenge to take on. Yeah. It was about seven. I have about 75 total students, and 75 total students just took it upon themselves to, to assign a block of schools, and they sent the emails, and then we got the responses, and we had literally almost three box, three file boxes of information for universities, and I, and I anyone who sent a anyone who sent a pendant got the pendant stuck on the wall. Awesome. So my room is full <laughs> of pendants, and I tell my parents all those colleges. Have an esports connection to them. That's a really great and quick way to convince parents that this is a real thing. I love it. 
very it's graphic it's visual and it's also like when you see schools like brown mm -hmm. and georgia tech and you know there, there's good schools there it's yeah. not you know like <laughs> like sally jones university in you know some strip mall somewhere you know what i'm saying yeah. no these are legit <laughs> universities that they've been seeing for years and would love their kids to go to awesome now you touched on a little bit there about vetting the program but what is it you do as the journal manager of esports nothing nothing Beautiful. I try to do. I try to do as little as possible. I find that the more involved I get, the worse it is. Okay. Um, when I was preparing for my doctorate degree, my my um, my preparation, my thesis was based on systems thinking, mm -hmm. and the the basis of that thought was make the pie bigger. How can I make, make the pie bigger? Not get a bigger piece of the pie for myself but make the pie bigger so that more people can eat from that pie. Okay. So I apply that same concept to, with, I try to do with everything that I'm involved with. So with eSports, I didn't want to centralize control at the general manager level. And I really didn't even want to centralize control at the president, vice president, treasurer level. I wanted control to go down to committees and groups so that the more people are involved, the more people have ownership of this club. Okay. So all I do is and is make sure everything's okay. I do a lot of checking and verifying, mm -hmm. and I show my president, especially my vice president, you're if, if you're doing stuff, you're not doing you're not doing your job. Your job is to make sure stuff is getting done. There's an old saying I'm going to misquote it for sure, <laughs> but the Dow the Dow says I do nothing yet every all my tasks are complete, and I like to live like that. You know I don't do anything, but yet everything I'm responsible for. It all gets done. <laughs> so, I had a boss is like, the, my job is to make sure you guys make me look good. <laughs> well, it's not that. I, I just, that that's a that's a different way of thinking, because that is me taking what you do for my benefit. I don't get anything out of this except mm -hmm. the pleasure of pushing people up. Awesome. Yeah, you know, I don't. There's nothing in this for me. I mean. Okay, yes, stop it. There's a stipend. There's a stipend because all club moderators get stipend, and, and NAF, NASEF has been very generous mm -hmm. in helping us out with stuff. But as far as for me personally, the benefit for me is building a program that's successful, building a program that hopefully in the future schools will come to look for players to play, that schools will come to look for people to enter their esports programs, that students will take what they learned in, my, in in our program and become successful outside that's that's my reward that's there's awesome nothing tan, there's nothing tangible in it for me there's no award there's no set of steak knives there's really <laughs> nothing for me awesome very cool and then um now i want to switch the conversation topic to our main topic which is the covid 19 pandemic and how it's drastically changing not only schooling but pretty much everything in our lives today right so to begin with when you and your students made that initial transition to distance distance learning, online learning, what were their own thoughts and reactions to it? I was I was really fortunate, and again, sometimes it's better to be lucky than good, in the sense that I read the tea leaves early. So, and it didn't take a super genius with like incredible foresight to figure this out. Mm -hmm. Why did the school want a? Why did the school want us? to meet with all our children every single day for the last three days of that week when we normally have block periods on and even days why did we go one through six wednesday thursday friday why did mm -hmm. we do that and i'm like we're not coming back on monday so when i saw that schedule i was fortunate in the sense that we already use canvas to submit assignments and to okay. get assignments so all my kids were used to that online platform mm -hmm. And then what I did was those last five days, I introduced Zoom. And even though I was sitting in the classroom with them, <laughs> we did everything through Zoom. Oh, very cool. So at least they got five days of practice. Mm -hmm. So then when Monday rolled around, we were meeting in a Zoom meeting because I already, they already had an email with the link to my PMI, which now it's, it's added to our vocabulary. We all know what our PMI is or, or what private meeting, something, whatever it's called. Invitation or something. Invitation, yeah. thank you. <laughs> And we all have that now, so everyone's got their own little private meeting space. And you know, I keep my meeting space open from 7:45 in the morning to around 
eleven thirty, and the kids. I have my three scheduled periods, and the kids come in and out when they need to and stuff. So that transition was easy. But again, um, I I do suffer about twenty percent drop off. Okay. There's about twenty percent of my kids that I that are not engaging. That are that if they do, I know for a fact they're they're logging in, and they're leaving. <laughs> I call their name and they don't answer. So it it's it's been a challenge. Um, we were concerned as teachers. Oh, this is the test that's going to make sure that this, they're going to find out that uh, that that they don't need us in the classroom anymore. <laughs> and I'll tell you something. What this has proved to me is that we will never be replaced by a computer. Mm -hmm. Never. Okay, because it's just not the same thing. And um, so I've got two sets. Of, I can divide my students in half. I've got two groups of students. I have a group of students that are not seniors and those that are seniors. Mm -hmm. Those that are not seniors, if the 80% that's engaging is learning, is preparing, is advancing, they have not skipped a beat. Okay. My seniors are <laughs> devastated. I my, my heart bleeds for those children. The amount of compassion I have for those children is, is, is amazing because they are devastated. Okay. Because think about it. Um, you're 18, 19 years old. Yeah. That's all you know. That's all you've been preparing for for four years now. If your four years, is, it's just about 20% of your life. Think about that. Uh, an 18 year old young person doesn't have the ability of the foresight to say, you know what? High school's not that, it's a big deal, but it's not that big a deal. College graduation's a big deal. Mm -hmm. My my marriage is gonna be a big <laughs> deal. The birth of my child is gonna be a big deal. These things are gonna dwarf my high school graduation. They don't have that vision. Mm -hmm. Not yet. They don't have that they, not yet, they don't have it yet because they haven't lived it. Mm -hmm. I didn't have it when I was 18. I remember, you know, I was, some girl broke up with me when I was 17 years old and I thought my life was over and I was never <laughs> going to live again. And you know what I'm saying? And, and, and you live, but that's the point, you know? Yeah. Um, so that's been the hardest thing is keeping seniors motivated. That's okay. been the hardest part of my job. All right. Now you said that, uh, you have a lot of engagement. You have some engagement problems with some of your students. Mm -hmm. What various methods are you using to keep them engaged? Um, no, I'm not successful in that. Okay. I've, I've been able, I've been able to do a. There's not one magic bullet. Mm -hmm. Number two, you're not going to grab all of them. So, I was trying to be genteel, and hold off putting grades in the grade book, and I said, you know what? Let me put the grades in all of them, even all the F's and the Z's. Z, you know, Z for not doing, zero for not doing it. Okay. And then once these students that weren't engaged saw that they were failing now that it requires a, a small bit of explaining my school is 100 percent magnet mm -hmm. so you don't go to my school unless you apply to my school my school is not your home school so that being said i'm knock on wood i'm extremely fortunate in the sense that i've got amazing students mm -hmm. not that all kids aren't great but i mean i have we as a school have like a fight a year maybe okay sometimes a fight every 18 months uh it's you when you walk through the hallways and you listen to what the kids are saying they're talking about assignments they're talking <laughs> about it. it's a different it's a different vibe it's yeah a, it's an amazing i've never worked in a place like that before in my life so when these kids see f's on the report cards and you call mom and dad up <laughs> there's a uh -oh. whole different layer there's a whole different level of motivation but on a serious note, um, you can't ignore the fact that now you have to consider some serious mental health issues. Mm -hmm. Depression is a real thing. So if you take a child that may have already had some depression issues in a normal environment, and now you isolate them like this, where they're not with their peers, um, those things can be exasperated, and I, I, you know, I know I've got some students going through some really, really dark times. Fortunately, in our county, we have trust counselors. Mm -hmm. We have mental health; they can, they can reach out for help. 
um, where they'll reach out to the students that we sub and we've been, I personally have been submitting names. Hey, look, so-and-so is not coming. And the last time they came, I can tell they're in a dark place. Their hair's not combed. <laughs> they were in, they were in their bed under the sheets. And so, Ooh. I mean, yeah, yeah exactly. So that, that's what, that's what you're seeing as a teacher. So you have to, you know, so when I force my kids, cause it's very easy to have a zoom meeting and just have the name show. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I force my, I want to see your face. I want to see your face. Yeah. Well, my camera's broken my laptop. Then call me on the phone. Call, use the phone <laughs> app. I want to see your face. I got to see your face at least once a week. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? If not, I'm going to, I'm going to make that a grade. I'm going to give you an F. I want to see your face. So I see my kids' faces I, once a week. Um, the ones that come, but I've got a three or three students right now that I'm, I'm seriously concerned about them. Okay. I know they're in a dark place. So how do you kind of, as a teacher that's online only right now, like dealing with that is so difficult. And you've mentioned that you've done things like, you know, reaching out, but is there anything else you've seen that you can do that might be effective? Um, they don't answer their phone because I have all their phone numbers and all the mm -hmm. kids have my phone number. I'm one of the, yeah, I, I was not that teacher and I, I became that teacher where like kids have my phone number and stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, because of this, of this type of child, I'll get a phone call on, on a Saturday at seven o'clock at night. Mr. Melton, this code's not working. I said, guys, I'm at, I'm at dinner. <laughs> I, can't, I can't do this now. <laughs> Send me an email. I'll get back to you. Oh, but Mr. Melton, really, I'm stuck. I said, yeah, I'm really at dinner with my wife. <laughs> Send me an email. I'll get to when I get home tonight. I will answer you tonight, though, I promise. So I have that relationship with a lot of my students, mm -hmm. but they see it's me and they don't answer. And then I give the I give the information to the school. So I mean, it's if look if you don't want to get reached, this is this is your meth. This is your environment. If you don't want to get contacted, this is ideal for you. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's sad, but it's true. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, kind of along the same lines, um, students and even workers such as myself, we're spending a lot of time in front of screens now because of everything. And how do you combat screen fatigue as a teacher with your students? And, and the worst part is that what I teach involves screen time mm -hmm. because you, last time I checked, you know, unity is on a computer, yeah. Python and Java are on a computer. So, you know, everything's on a computer. Um, I, I'm not seeing the screen fatigue. Okay. And I'll, I'll segue for you. What I am seeing is a lack of desire for gaming. Okay. And I thought it would be the opposite. I genuinely thought, oh man, we'll never get these kids to class. They'll never stop playing games enough to come to class. And I'm noticing that there's a lot less esports going on out there, that the desire for esports even among my non-seniors is very limited. Um, we've gone ahead and we've experimented with some, uh, some, some you know, Switch is huge, um, mm -hmm. Smash is huge, and we've tried to do some Smash things. Two, three kids show up. Now my meetings at school were over 100 every Friday. My school's population is like 1,300. Okay. So You've I got have, a significant I portion. I easily have eight to ten percent of the school in my classroom every Friday <laughs> afternoon. Okay, and I'm, I'm and I'm very proud of those kids for running that meeting and running that organization. They do a great job, and the excitement level was was super high up until Friday the thirteenth when we had to cancel the last meeting. Um, and that drop off was instant, instant. Mm -hmm. So we tried to do things like have um, game nights on a Friday. We tried having just Zoom meetings where we can talk about anything that's not gaming. Mm -hmm. Because one of the things that I realized is we had to become, for esports to stay relevant, we had to become or we are becoming what they need. Now, what they need might be, hey, I just need a place to hang out and talk 
mm -hmm. about about the situation and it has nothing to do with esports and i get i get goosebumps because when we when we started doing that we started seeing more participation again not huge but from two or three eight or nine a dozen now okay. we're scratching 20. scratching 20. that's a so good it uptick is, it's a it's a good uptick in a month that we started doing this and you know and sometimes it does lead off to break off into a game and and for some reason don't ask me why minecraft is becoming <laughs> huge don't ask me why well i, can't, I, don't I know it. minecraft has uh a lot of rtx features coming out which make the game look absolutely gorgeous yes yes <laughs> Especially if you have one of the, one of the better higher high end. Yeah, it requires uh, one of the cards. twenty series cards, but it is yes. gorgeous. If you have, <laughs> if you have something like a what, like a twenty forty or twenty sixty and like higher, like a twenty sixty it, usually, yeah. It's it's crazy how good it is. Mm -hmm. Awesome. And then um, you said you have a very close relationship with a lot of your students. It sounds like yes. Are you seeing the relationships change at all significantly because of this online teaching only? Um. It's become distant, as you would expect. Mm -hmm. It's become more. It's become distant. Um, it's it's odd in the sense that a teacher is always a counselor. Okay. A teacher is always. I'm I. I'm not my student's friend by any means because friends can get into fights and friends <laughs> can get into arguments and friends can stop being friends. But I like to tell my students that I'm I'm your teacher, you're my student. That relationship will be there forever. Mm -hmm. It can change, of course. You know, some you know students that I had 15 years ago call me Peter. They don't call me Mr. Melton anymore, and that's cool. I'm good with that. You know what I'm saying? But I do have contact with students I had 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. Not a lot, but a few. Occasionally, yeah. You know? Yeah, exactly. And some more than others for different reason. And um, I've noticed myself that. I'll, uh, a, a portion of the Zoom meeting after class are kids crying because they can't keep up. Hmm. Our kids crying because they were really looking forward to a graduation and, and they feel devastated. Mostly my seniors, underclassmen, it's not the issue. But I mean, I've got these, you know, 17, 19, 18, 18 year old young people just crying. I mean, the world's been changed dramatically. Yeah. Yeah, and, and they're scared and you know and someone once someone once told me that fear is often a reflection of intelligence. That if you're not scared of anything, you're not thinking about what, about the world around you. And if you're if you're fearful of things, you're thinking and processing. Mm -hmm. And I think some of my kids are very, very smart and, and they're 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 concerned about what the world is gonna look like. Now, what's next semester in college going to look like? Some of these, I've got kids that are going to go that range that the range is going from the honors college at, the, at our local community college to kids going to Carnegie Mellon, uh, Stevens Tech in Hoboken. I got a couple kids going to Brown. I mean, I got kids going. You know, it runs the gamut. Mm -hmm. I got a couple kids going to the local state school. So these are all kids that are and and again, this I'm bragging about. <laughs> My program is a hundred percent college bound. There's not a, I, in That's the four years that I've been worth bragging there, about. In in the four years that I've been at that school, a hundred percent of my kids have gone to college, with one exception: the ones that have gone to the military. I've had four kids enter the military, and all the rest have gone to college. So I, I'm I'm real proud of that. But that's really more of a testament of the kids we have more than anything. Mm -hmm. the, they're going to go to college despite me. <laughs> um, but they, they're scared and they don't know what the world's going to look like, you know, and, and I respect that because they're thinking and what's this going to look like? I have no idea. I mean, we're talking about school for next term and quite frankly, I don't see it. I, I think you're looking at a new normal. Hmm. I think you're looking at a hybrid of, you know, there's, there's going to be some hybrid of live and not live for a while to come for the next year or so mm -hmm. okay now when the world does return to a more normal state hopefully sooner rather than later 
do you think there's going to be a significant change in teaching methods because of this extended online learning that we're doing? Because you mentioned earlier, you don't think that you're ever going to be replaced. No, I, that fear is gone. Now, I will say this, and I have discussed this with some of my colleagues. I'm working harder now than before. Okay. Before, I would go through my book. Let's say, for example, I was doing, you know, teaching Java chapter seven. I review it. I have a PowerPoint. I edit the PowerPoint every year, make it a little different, whatever, mm -hmm. and uh, go for it. Well, I had two hours. I can play with things. I can wing some things. I can embellish. I can go on. Kids would talk. They'd add content to the class. They'd make things interesting because there was another voice besides mine. But now I've got 50, 55 minutes. I've got to take chapter seven now. And I've got to take, well, I know that AP test is going to test on this content. And I got to dissect, pull that information out, get it in a PowerPoint or get it in some code and get with some, use my notepad plus plus and get some notes on there so that I can laser point. And so I've had to step up my game hmm. a lot. You know what I'm saying? Because you know, I want my kids to get a good education. I want these kids to pass the AP, the AP test on Friday. I, I want them to pass their AP test. We have also industry certification exams. I need all these kids to get their industry certifications. I can't, I can't, you know, they have, that's, that's what we are. So I would like to think that we're going to be successful no matter what the world throws at us. And I do that not for me, because what I told my seniors is, look, you took an AP exam. We're gonna get the grades in July. You have a capstone that you're working on. The capstones are coming out great. So despite this horrible curveball the world has thrown to you, all of you have risen. You've all come to the challenge. You've all, and I'm using the success that we're getting mm -hmm. to motivate them, to show them what a great job they're doing. So it's, again, I mean, there's nothing in it for me, except the fact that I love doing this. Mm -hmm. But the, the goal of pushing these kids is to show them, hey, look, no matter how crappy things are right now, you guys are kicking butt and you're kicking butt at a high level because they're doing some amazing things. And, um, and again, these kids know some of them, a lot of them know more than I do. I've mm -hmm. got kids that are doing artificial intelligence programs using facial recognition software <laughs> that, that, that they're right. Yeah. In high school, Jeez. you know, yeah, yeah. I, I had another group of kids that was, I was using, uh, basically C sharp to, to create a platform that you drop the steel ball on. It would balance a steel ball. Hmm. I can't do that. <laughs> Don't I look at me. No, but the, that's, but the point is, um, because of the type of, student that I have and the type of environment that I'd be able to create three or four of them can work on a project and just boom, run with it. Awesome. And they can do some amazing things. And, and the purpose of being successful is to prove to them, Hey, look, anyone can be great when things are easy, mm -hmm. but you guys are being great. Now you guys are being great. Now when we're in lockdown and we don't have access to things and we don't have our, all the equipment that we have and you're still being outstanding. And again, I use that as a mirror to hold it up to say, Hey, look, look how great you guys are. Not to, not to give them some false sense of security or confidence, but I mean, think about how things are right now. It's so much easier just to check out and just do the minimum. Yeah, no, I definitely agree. It definitely is very easy to check out right now. And that's great that you're supporting them and inspiring them still. And then uh, I do want to touch briefly on another point you had talked about previously was giving your students more ownership of this program. Yes. Yes. Why, why do you want to do that Cause, and what will they gain from it? I, for one, do not believe in buy-in. I don't think buy-in exists. Okay. Um, and there's a lot of research to, to support that position. There's a lot of research for that. At the end of the day, Jeff, if I say to you, let's do something, believe my plan, and you say, yeah, Pete, I believe your plan, let's work and work, let's do this. 
when you go back to your classroom or to your environment and things get tough and you find yourself, whoa, I'm in a pressure situation, mm -hmm. people are going to revert back to what they do and ignore the buy-in plan. That's that's pretty much an accepted belief, I believe, you know. Okay. So how do you solve that problem? Mm -hmm. Well, in the case of a club, if it's the Miami Lakes Educational Esports Club sponsored by Mr. Melton, well, then it's my club and they belong in my club and it's my club and it's my this. It's my. Well, no, this is the Miami Lakes Educational Center Esports Club and you, Eddie, you, Vanessa, you, Christian, you, Julian, you are the Miami Lakes Educational Esports Club. And so by creating ownership, what I want to do is I want to I want them to own it. I mm -hmm. want it to be their club, not my club, not the school's club. It can be the school's club. And this is now semantics because they're part of the school. Mm -hmm. It's their school. So I try to create a strong sense of of positive school attitude and then ownership of the club because if you've been involved in a high school club, you'll notice that you'll have 100 and some kids in the first week of school and you'll have 25 in May. Now, the reason I was able to have um, the week before, so that would be March 13th was the last day, March 6th. I was able to have close to 90 some kids at that meeting was because it had nothing to do with me. Mm -hmm. Nothing. I mean, there are things that I do to help. Um, I, tr I try to know all their names. I try to identify what they're doing in the club at, or in school and complement that specific activity during a club meeting. Um, I don't tolerate any garbage. And by garbage, I mean, if you go to our club, it's, it's, it's the most beautiful thing in the world because you have the smart kids, the ones who aren't so smart, the straight kids, the gay kids, the jocks, the nerds, and they're all there. Mm -hmm. I got kids that go to esports club who don't play esports. In fact, I would venture to say, 40% don't play. That's a lot. I've got a group of kids that sit there and play guitar. I got a group of kids that just come to draw. Mm -hmm. I have a group of kids that just come because they need a place to be for, for until the parents come pick them up. You know, so I, I'm trying to take that same idea and bring it into this situation and then my conversations with my students are is not or the conversation with my is not well what game can we play to get kids excited the conversation is what can we do to get you guys involved and, and be happy about what's going on right now okay very cool and it, yeah and what do you guys need what do you guys need? What space do you guys need so that you can come and be together and be a part of something and feel good about, you know, feel good for 90 minutes or an hour or however long we're together for? What do you guys need? So when they start doing these things, when it stopped, because see, when I was saying, hey, let's play Smash uh, Friday at six o'clock for two hours, have a little turn, blah, blah, blah. One, three people. Okay. But when I opened it up and I said, okay, what do you guys want to do? I started with my offices. What do you guys want to do? Oh, this and this. Okay, fine. Let's, let's, let's make that happen. Let's sit together on, on whatever day you guys want to. Let's get together. We'll come to this meeting space and, and we'll let's just talk. Back in the 60s and 70s, let's get together and have a little rap session. That was an old term for that. All, all the old <laughs> teachers will know what that means, have a rap session. But that's what they want. Kids mm -hmm. need a place to hang out and talk and get their frustrations out because the parents don't want to hear it. They don't want to <laughs> say it to the <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And it gets them out. And, and if it means using things like Discord, which I can't stand because I just don't know how to use it yet. You know? and, and even though I pay the five bucks a month for Nitro, I, I, I can't get an, an animated gift to work yet. I mean, you know, 
You'll get there. I, 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 with help of my students. My students are going to bail me out on that one. But again, it, it's just becoming what they need. And if that means it's not esports, then right now it's just not esports. I have to accept that. But at least, at least the esports club stays relevant because it's it's taking care of the needs of people. You know, like like right now you go down, to, I live in a nice neighborhood. And if you wake up in the morning at seven o'clock to around 11, the line for food goes three and a half, four miles. Mm -hmm. Those people need food. Yeah. They, they don't need a video game. They're worried about what, what the, you know what I'm saying? And I, I've got kids in that situation right now. I got kids whose parents lost both jobs. I've got kids who are facing some really dire situations at home. And playing a game is the least of their importance. They, 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 they're smart kids. These kids are smart. All these kids are smart. Not just mine. They all are. You know what I'm saying? And if and and the one thing, and I'm going to digress a little bit. Mm -hmm. People always say, "Oh, these kids of the future." I've never. I'm so concerned. I'll tell you, I'm the complete opposite. I have never been so encouraged by a group of kids. I've seen so much compassion and tolerance and care for the environment and care for one another and and a, and a sincere interest in education that I have ever seen in my entire life. I am more confident in these kids now than I have been ever in the 21 years I've been teaching. I feel, and, and that's been, I've been seeing that, that progress. And it's, it's an amazing thing. So these kids are special. So if our esports is going to be successful when we come out of this thing, and we will come out of this thing, it may not look the same way, but we will definitely come out of this. Mm -hmm. We have to identify the needs of our students and meet those needs even if that need is as simple as hanging out and giving a place to talk and vent that's it and just do that all right uh last thing i want to ask is um what has been the most rewarding part of this experience for you easy watching watching students continue to be successful even in the most mundane things like doing their daily assignments and turning in their homework to seeing these kids, you know, we were prepping for that AP exam and those kids were just like knocking out of the park. And I sit back and like, yes, awesome. These, <laughs> they got it. You know, that their, their success and their ability to, to continue and continue and do and do and do for the, for the 80% that are engaging that's been an incredible sense of uh, that's been that's been a big reward for me, very big reward. That's awesome. Um, I mean, I know I, I've definitely felt it, but I, I feel like everyone else is going to be able to see the passion you have and how proud you are of your students in your program and just overall at your school. Great. No, I love those kids. I really do. I I, I mean, don't get me wrong. I, I like getting paid, but I feel guilty <laughs> every two weeks. Is it really for this. <laughs> Awesome. Well, that is. I'll be, I'll be, I'll be back yeah. next week. <laughs> <laughs> that is all I have for you. I want to thank you very much for taking the time to talk with me. Uh, it's, it's been, been a, a very, it's been a very interesting conversation talking about how the pandemic has changed our lives. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, hopefully, our viewers will feel the same way, uh, and it's been educational uh, for all of you out there. Stay tuned. We've got more interviews with teachers from Florida about their esports program. Until then, stay safe, everyone. Great. Thanks for having me.